This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Call Scott Edward Walker directly at 415-979-9998 or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. And Asana. Asana gives teams everything they need to manage projects and tasks, work productively, and deliver better results faster. Visit asana.com slash twist to sign up for free. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, an angel investor here in Silicon Valley. I invest in about 30, 40 companies a year. And of those 150 investments, as you know, famously, six are now unicorns. We're searching for our seventh unicorn. A unicorn, if you're wondering, is a company that is valued at over $1 billion. If I invest in a company, it's typically in the low single digit million. So if it becomes a unicorn, an investment at $5 million could grow 200x. And that's a lot of chatter. But more importantly, we get to shape the future here in Silicon Valley by finding great entrepreneurs and backing them in their early, early days. My job is to never underestimate anyone because a great founder can come from anywhere. And typically, the great founders find their way here to the cradle of technology and innovation, the Bay Area, San Francisco, Menlo Park, Mountain View, Palo Alto, the surrounding area. If you ever have a great startup that has a product in market and is looking to raise money, that's my Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, You can just email me, jason at calacanis.com. That's my first name at my last name. Buy my book, Angel, angelthebook.com, and you'll understand how I think. And you can listen if you'd like to Angel Podcast, my other podcast, angelpodcast.com, which is a podcast where I interview other angel investors and talk about what they're investing in. I bring all this up because I was lucky enough through our conference launch festival, which we host once a year, and for the next two years, we'll be hosting it in Sydney in June. You can go to launchfestivalsydney.com. And about two or three years ago, my guest uh, today, Bill Barheit, I got it right, right? Yeah, Barheit. Yeah, uh, won the festival with his company, Abra, A-B-R-A, Abra, like Abracadabra. There, there you go. Abra, uh, if I remember correctly, was it two years? Re- First of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great good to, to be see you. You look good. Um, was it two or three years ago? Three. It was three years ago. That's right. And you had a crazy idea which was, hey, this Bitcoin thing, which at the time was trading at $100. If that. If that. Yeah. uh, Is a great, amazing innovation. And money transfer would be a great thing to do for the developing world where people are getting hammered by huge Western Union fees. And I said, this is a killer idea. Bitcoin has a use case. And so you created human tellers, human Mm -hmm. bank tellers. Mm -hmm. So one could be in Mexico, one could be in Los Angeles, let's say, to pick a common route, I think, of uh, how money flows and send $100. A individual ATM, human ATM could walk up, take your $100. And on the other side, your mom could go find another human ATM and get $100. And those two people would charge a little bit. It'd be under 10% as opposed to the predatory amounts. That was the original vision. I think I invested in the company. You did? <laughs> the company was worth what? Five million at the time? Ten uh, million? A little more, but not much. Yeah. Maybe ten. Yeah, yeah maybe. maybe. Maybe ten. I think I put a hundred thousand dollars in. Something like that. Yeah. So I own one percent, maybe. Yeah. So here's the big drum roll. Yeah. Two questions to lead us off. Sure. First, did the original idea for Abra uh, Abra work, which was to have human tellers transferring money? Your original brilliant idea. And if not, uh, what worked and didn't, and how have you pivoted the company? Yep. And then number two, most importantly, in the minds of our listeners and me, how much money have I made? How far up has this investment <laughs> gone? Because you and I don't talk that often. Right. So, so the second answer, the second question might be easier to answer okay. first. What am I? Because you can't sell your stock today. So, so it's worth zero. Yeah. So, so <laughs> it's worth. Actually, I was going to say it's worth whatever you decide it's worth, since you can't Great, sell it. Like Bitcoin. So, there you go. <laughs> it is. What you can sell Bitcoin. So. You can. 
So, so I'm locked uh, in, the, but I'm up 10X But, but or the good something. news is, so am I. So yeah. we're in the same boat, right? But so I'm up like 10X. That's what I, I would hear. say at least. The rumor on the street is I'm up at least yeah, 10X. Yeah, probably more than that, actually. All right. But, that's but a nice that's feeling. That's all good, at least good. on paper. Um, and so back to your first question about uh, where Abra is versus the original uh, pitch and vision and mission. So I'll tell you what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we started rolling out like two plus years ago this original concept of the Abra Teller, which you... Uh, very well articulated, which was to be basically a virtual ATM machine using cryptocurrency as the rails to move money as opposed to banks. And the whole idea of ABRA, ABRA, a better remittance app was how do we move money around without the banks? Because that was Mm. my background before that was trying to work with the banks to do it. And that was a disaster. Right. So I had architected this solution using crypto for the first time as as an application as opposed to just digital gold, which is how everybody else was using it. So here's what we learned. And, and when you say the term digital co- gold, explain to people what that means, because that's a term the cryptocurrency community yeah. uses, but that may have slipped past people and they don't understand it. What does it mean when you say crypto gold? When people say digital gold in, in, in regards to Bitcoin, I, I think what most people mean is a stable store of value, something okay. that's not going to be inflated to oblivion, right? Like paper money is, right? Our, our money is worth 99% less than it was 150 years ago. The only reason we don't care is, is that we weren't alive and the people mm. who were alive are dead. Right. So uh, if you were still alive, you'd care a lot. Right. Right. Okay. So that can, in theory, that can happen with Bitcoin, which is why people refer to it as because there's a limited gold. number of Bitcoins in existence. Exactly. It's a fixed number. Exactly. There's no government that can print more. Exactly. It's what we call deflationary in, right. in kind of the economic terminology, right? right. Meaning, meaning that it's the opposite of inflationary. Right. So, so as opposed to just treating it like an asset class. Abra actually treats it like what we call programmable money, the mm. same way TCPIP is, enables programs on the internet, right? You log into Netflix, you actually make a TCP socket connection, even though you don't actually know that's happening. We wanted to use Bitcoin literally as programmable, programmable money to move money from A to B, meaning from person A to person B. And that was part of a broader vision around creating a global financial inclusion play for consumers in every country in the world. Yeah. My vision was rich bankers in New York, poor farmers in Ghana, all using the same app. Amazing. Right. All right. Now, what's worked, what hasn't worked? The Teller model itself actually works very well. The difference between, think of, think of that democratizing money the way Uber democratizes cars. Now, the challenge with, with Abra versus Uber is, is if Uber is only live in San Francisco, the drivers in San Francisco can actually make money and the consumers will have a great experience. If Abra Tellers are only live in one part of San Francisco, it's a disaster. Ah, so, right. Because there's no liquidity in the system. Right. So what we found was in order to get Abra to work at reasonable scale, the amount of money it was going to take to deploy these tellers was ca- analogous to what it costs Uber to deploy drivers all over the world at once. Right. OK. So now pockets of tellers, like when we deployed them in the Philippines, were actually working quite well. They loved the money. They loved the experience, the technology. It all worked. Yes. OK. So what we found was, was that people were starting to use the tellers to actually buy Bitcoin. Fascinating. Okay. And so there was a bigger trend that was occurring. Yes. Money transfer was nice, but you have this marketplace issue. We have to build up both sides. Second issue, though, yeah. right, which is actually even more important than the tellers. Now, think about companies in the, 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 the digital companies in the money transfer space that you probably know, Zoom, sure. Remitly, uh, companies that are well-funded from the VC world. Those companies spend anywhere from $80 to $100 to acquire a customer. Our belief was was using the teller network that we would be able to get around that by having them act as quasi affiliates for signing up customers. Sure. But related to the first problem, because we couldn't sign them up fast enough, hmm. we were still st- stuck in that rut of paying the same cost to acquire a customer. As that's why Zoom sold to PayPal right. it was because they couldn't afford to acquire customers to compete with Western Union. So what we said is, well, our customers are pulling us towards basically becoming an investment vehicle using crypto because it turns out we had a phenomenal user experience. Mm. It wasn't a trading-like experience. It was a very Venmo-like experience on a phone. So we went with it, started interviewing our users, and they said, you guys are onto something here. Whether it's using ACH in the U.S. or using the tellers in the Philippines, make it super easy for us to buy crypto, and we love it. But then the feedback was, well, you're just giving us Bitcoin, and in parallel, all these other cryptocurrencies are becoming popular. Right? We call them altcoins in our world. Sure. Right? A lot of your viewers probably haven't heard of half of them. Right. But a lot of them are becoming popular in different pockets of the crypto community. Everybody's Which ones heard, are they? Give me some Well, names. the ones that people have heard of now are Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash. But then there's another 15 beyond that that the app supports now hmm. using the same model and the same technology stack that we created 
for money transfer. So people can just buy crypto by handing money to a teller. In the Philippines, In the Philippines, for example. And in the U.S., they can use their bank account. Right. And our goal is to continue to deploy both. So in the Western markets, we'll have bank in and out to be able to buy and sell crypto this year. Right. And then next year, we'll focus more on expanding the tellers in developing markets to use cash. Got it. And so you're actually, so the original vision was democratizing access to banking. Well, here's what, here's this interesting side effect. If we have 5 million users, they mm. can all use the app to send money for free ah. without us having to market it. So now we're actually an investment vehicle and a payments vehicle. So it kind of becomes the crypto bank. Got it. So it's a circuitous route to the same vision. All right. When we get back from this quick break, you have a big announcement about supporting a bunch of different fiat currencies, which I think means and money and from other yeah. countries yep. and more crypto. That's so we'll right. demo the new product when we get back on This Week in Startups. Yeah. Ah, yes. Scott Walker, my good friend, attorney to startups. If you need a great attorney, I want you to meet Scott Walker of the Walker Corporate Law Group. They are a boutique law firm. They specialize in representing and relentlessly supporting startups like you. And they don't charge billable hours. No, they do fixed fees. Why? Because billable hours reward inefficiency. They want you to know what you're going to spend on incorporating, raising money, mer mergers and acquisitions, terms of service, all the important things. But most important is what I want to tell you today. Scott Walker, I've known for years, and he is a great supporter of startups and all the lawyers at his firm have decades of experience, 10, 20 years. You're not going to get a junior associate learning on your account and making mistakes in your startup. No. Scott Walker's got a great team over at the Walker Corporate Law Group. And if you want to talk directly to the founder himself, Scott Walker, call 415-979-9998. That number, 415. That's San Francisco. 979-9998. Scott is an old friend. He does a great job. You can email him directly, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. And the phone number again, 415-979-9998. Scott's a great guy. Everybody I send over there to his team, uh, every founder I send comes back with a great report. They took their time. They explained everything to me. They held my hand. They made sure I understood the documents I was signing He's just a class act all around, and he does a great job. So give him a call, 415-979-9998. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode of This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jason or on Instagram at Jason. You can email me, Jason at Calacanis. All of those great things. And if you love the show, please do us a favor. Go to thisweekinstartups.com and subscribe to all the different channels you can subscribe to us on and write a review on iTunes because that means a lot to my mom. And today's guest, Bill Barheit, is the CEO and founder of Abra, like Abracadabra, A-B-R-A.com. Or on Twitter, you can follow Abra Global. I'm an investor. I have been super critical of crypto because it seems to have gone on a crazy tear. And there's been a bunch of ICOs because I'm a professional angel investor that I just saw all these hundreds of companies raising money. You have me as an investor. So you see me out there publicly going, what the heck's going on out here mm. with this ICO stuff? I do believe in the core technologies. Right. What do you think of what's occurred because you were an early true believer, a pioneer in the space uh, who got in when crypto was nascent. What do you think about what's occurred, Bill, in the last 18 months specifically with yep. ICOs and yep. this incredible boom bust cycle we've seen? So let's talk about the ICOs first and then we can come back to just okay. kind of tried and true crypto. Initial coin offerings. Yeah, yes. initial coin offerings. And some people will say ITOs, initial token offerings, but generally ICOs. So, so people look at ICOs in two buckets, right? There's the ones that look and smell like securities, mm -hmm. but are kind of, in theory, instantly liquid because you can buy and sell the tokens. Got it. Okay. And then there's um, tokens that they ref refer to as utility tokens, which actually have a function, in theory, that serves the company and its users beyond just representing ownership in some entity. Got it. Now, to your point, most of the companies over the past 18 months that have been creating these ICOs have been trying to pitch themselves as what I would call these utility tokens. 
Right. right. Which means they're not subject to normal SEC registration or the normal rules that your investments would have to go through if they list an angel list, for example. Right. right. Now, or Jason Syndicate. Or Jason Syndicate. Exactly. Yeah. So, so my point is, is that I actually believe that most of these companies that pitch themselves as utility tokens are not. They are simply securities with window dressing. And now what the SEC is saying, hey, you're pitching yourselves as utility tokens when you really are securities with window dressing. Mm. And so they're starting to crack down on that and basically send the message that there's nothing wrong, to your point, with the technology of doing an ICO, just like there's nothing wrong with using your syndicate on AngelList versus the old way, yeah. right, 15 years ago, but the rules still apply. Right. Right. And so that's good because then everybody understands. Right. Right. Whether you agree with the rules or not, they're there and they're meant to be followed. But nobody followed them. Why didn't anybody follow them? Because everybody saw a window and lawyers were enabling this. It's Cooley. Not, I heard Cooley got it wrong. I'll pick on all of them. Yeah. Every firm. That's was, I don't know if that's true or not. I just want to say I mean, before Cooley well, I sues me, but I heard I that Cooley was cool. advising I'll, a bunch of people that these were utility I'll put them all in this bucket. Every yeah. firm I talked to was willing to make a clear distinction got between it. utility and security and basically enabled to a certain degree entrepreneurs who easily could have used the model as securities if they had just followed the process. Got it. But right? instead they chose to do utilities. Right. Got bad and legal advice. And I don't know happening. if this is Cooley's position or not, by the way. We'll have him on the program. This is still happening. Now, a lot of what, what these companies are doing yeah. is they're just basically saying, we're going to do it, but outside the U.S. Got it. So like the Telegram ICO, my understanding is the $1.7 billion in theory included no U.S. investors because they didn't want to deal with the securities issue. Really? But they said Benchmark and Sequoia and a bunch of other I, famous VCs participated, I, but I've never gotten confirmation. I've never gotten confirmation, nor do I understand how they would they would actually do it if they're not allowed. But I know, I don't, I'm not sure about Telegram, but I know for a fact that a lot of these ICOs mm. are forbidding U.S. investors for participating right. exactly for this reason. And now uh, the statistics are that 60 or 70 percent of the ICOs that occurred just in the last year or so are gone. They're not responding. They're not up and running. They're just gone. Well, I hadn't heard Where that. did I all mean, the money go? It's an interesting question. I mean, think about the model because it's, it's it, in the dot-com craze, yeah. the IPO replaced the C-round, yeah. right? The ICO is replacing angel funding. So these companies are pitching. With it's even white. before. It's friends and family it's friends because and family. it's before or, they're yeah. even launched. Right. So it's with the white paper is what I yeah. was going to say. Yeah. So, so you really have to trust that the person that you're putting the money in you know, is going to stick around. Right. <laughs> right. At first and foremost. Right. And that they have you some know. reputation and you have some knowledge right. of who they are. Now, now think and about, people don't. But think about the metrics from, from an angel like yourself perspective. How many deals do you do a year? It's a numbers. Like how many deals do you have to do statistically to guarantee a return? And do you think that the average ICO investor is playing the game the way an angel investor does? And no. the answer is, of course not. No. So the chances of them actually making money, statistically speaking, is are impossible. Zero. It's zero. impossible. Yeah. But people aren't thinking about that because these tokens are instantly liquid. So it became, because they were instantly liquid. They are still. Then they, they are still. They are still. The, but there has to be a buyer on the other side. So even if they're instantly liquid and there's no buyer, then you can't sell them. But, but, but if the buyer thinks that they can then make a 15% profit next week yeah. by passing on the buck. So that multi-level or instant tradability created a level of greed that I believe was then stroked by let's call them charlatans and or promoters. I think they call them promoters in the business, the ICO business. These promoters then went out and said, I'll give you, because they came to me all the time, half off, two for one, three for one, just tweeted, Floyd May of the Weathers tweeting it, blah, 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 blah. And then those people sold them when the public got a chance, so they got 3x return and then kept half their tokens. Yeah. This kind of shenanigans is a little crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, look, we had shenanigans in the dot-com world, too, mm. uh, you know, back in the 90s. Huh. But now let's, let, let's just but let's be fair, right? I can give you a list of companies that have really interesting tech that are utilities. That tell did me. Do, right? So okay. like, I'll give you a few examples. Well, here, tell me the ones that are launched and that people are using. Uh, Bancor. Is what does really, that do? Uh, it's basically, it's a very complex network that uh -huh. basically does atomic swaps of assets using a, a crypto-based model. It's based mm -hmm. in Israel. Guy Benarzi is actually out of, went to high school in so Palo Alto. they sold tokens? Uh, they sold ICO tokens. They raised tens of millions of dollars. Totally legit, really interesting tech. I'm big Are fans. the tokens in use? Yes. They're part of the network itself. Okay. So how would one use the token? 
Can you explain it, it or not? It's, it's complex, but basically the token is part of the process of doing a transaction itself. Okay, so you like can, a fee. It's actually somewhat similar to Abra, in, but with a different architecture. Got okay? it. Meaning that they have this model for representing assets. Mm-hmm. It's very complex, but their token gets used in the transaction itself. It's a okay. very clever design. So like a fee or something. Right. I'm a big believer, for example, in Orchid, which hasn't launched yet. Okay. Steve Waterhouse's company here in San Francisco, I think what he's doing is super interesting. What is it going to be? What is it uh, promise basically to be? a better tour. Right, Got it. That uses the token Tor network uh, uh, the, the, for privacy, the for onion privacy. routing. Yeah, yeah. So you'll use these for utilization of the in, network. In theory, to move packets of data around in a secure way. You'll pay for, with tokens. Exactly. Uh, EOS, which is launching this summer, supposedly the alpha version is working well, it's supposed mm. to launch in June. Okay, so, so of are, these... I don't want to just say that the space is corrupt. It's not. Okay. The tech is sound for doing an ICO. It's just Ether at the end right. of the day. It's just Ethereum. It's it's the specific projects and the way that some people are marketing the projects mm. that you might have a problem with. Well, there's As that. A, the marketing seems sinister and FOMO-based. And then in addition to that, you as somebody who's an expert in the field and I know and trust can only name one that's actually in utilization. Well, I can name more, but... but well, no, no. Yeah, but in yeah. terms of what's actually being used in the market, I'm sure mm-hmm. you could name 20. And I yeah. know a lot of my friends yeah. who are experts in the field can name 10 or 20. But when I say ones that are actually being utilized, sure. people say the one you're talking about, I've heard before, Bancor. Mm-hmm. And then I've heard Brave, mm-hmm. the browser Brave, the does browser. stuff. Civic is live. Civic is live. So there's like yeah. three maybe that yeah. are lightly used, but not really. But they're startups. Used. So so yeah. the, the level of usage is, I mean, you can make the analogy to angel investing as well. Well, but, I will say this. The ones that I invest in tend to have their products in market, have some traction. If but you that's would, your style of angel investing. In but fairness, three though. out of 2,000 ICOs, yeah. four. And I'm not an expert use. in all of them, by the yeah. way, to be fair to them. Yeah. Look, I... I'm the not, number seems I, staggering. I don't invest in ICOs because right. I think it's a conflict with my day job. Right. But at the end of the day, I do think that there are some that are actually producing interesting tech. I think there are a lot of them that are securities that aren't being marketed as securities. Hmm. And I think that's going to get cleaned up. Got it. Right. All right. So we're going to, uh, I think we are in kind of in agreement. I think you're being, I'm being kind of candid and brutal and you're being, mag- I get the sense you're being magnanimous since you have a real business. Well, my business is not dependent upon the ICO And not market. dependent on this nonsense. So what but else? Are, how do you choose? Are you actually trading tokens in the in Abra now? Not, not ICO tokens. Not ICO tokens. Right. Now, Just some of them may have been launched as ICO tokens, but they're crypto projects. I mean, crypto technically, projects. Ether and Ripple were launched as ICOs, you could say. Got right? it. Yes, they you, you, just sold them and yeah there was an initial sale initial sale so so but these are real cryptos and so the way we decide so so the announcement is is that the abra app now supports 20 cryptocurrencies wow and 50 fiat currencies it's the first app of its kind to be able to do that with one button exchange between all 70 tokens so a guy could take the south korean won and trade it for the mexican pesos and trade it for ethereum and trade ethereum for, for ripple whatever exactly 100 wow. percent nothing like it exists in my knowledge and you make a little it. vague each it's time a, you do it's that an fx spread and we make money on the fx and it's a, what does it's, that mean, FX? So, so, so there's oh, when you look at when you go to uh, TravelX at the airport, there's a buy price and a sell price. Yeah, right. That spread is is a spread between the spot price, Got and th- and that that difference is their profit minus and their and and ah. or their revenue, and then their margin is. So their, when I buy and sell between them, who makes that spread? You make it. We define the spread. Got it. The markets define the spot price. So Got Abra it. acts as a market maker behind the scenes, integrating with ah. all of the crypto exchanges. It's very sophisticated what we're doing. And then that determines which 20 currencies we can support because they're the ones that are the most liquid. Got it. If they're not liquid, we can't support them because our market making system won't work. Let me ask you a question about the liquidity. Sure. There was a report in the early days that uh, Bitcoin was manipulated from $100 to $1,000 and that the volume that's going on, some portion of that volume is maybe not real. Yeah. What are your take on that claim that we hear over and over again? That because I watch the volume of some of this, you know, twentieth crypto on Coin Market Cap, and I look at it and go, "There's no way twenty five million dollars in the twentieth crypto traded hands today." What's going on there? Why don't I understand what's going on there? Right, right. So I think a couple of years ago, and I, don't, I think this is happening less now, but I think a couple of years ago uh, in China in particular. A lot of the exchanges were charging zero fees for certain types of transactions, mm. which allowed you to pump massive volume effectively to yourself. Got it. In the exchange. And it looked like what was happening was was the government said, hey, stop doing this. Mm. If, if they really were. I have no right. evidence that they were, but a lot of people right. believe they were. Uh, and, and actually, if you look at the volume, it, I could actually say that does make sense that that was happening. Because the volume 
just it, it didn't add up. It didn't add up. Right. And, and, and so I, I think the volume today does add up. So I think a lot of that ah. manipulation is happening less. Now, we didn't talk about the craze in the crypto market itself. My yes. take on that is, is that there are actually a large number of holders who are not interested in selling. Right. So the number the of HODL s- crowd, the HODL crowd, we call H-O-D-L, it. Right. HODL, which is a misspelling of hold. hold. Right. Specific to Bitcoin. Specific originally. to Bitcoin. But now it applies. That to became crypt- a meme. A meme for crypto in general. Yes. But I think that most of these large holders or HODLers are generally not interested in selling at any price right now. Meaning whether it's a thousand or 50,000, they're not going to Yeah, no, it sell. hit 19,000 and it they went sell. up like in right. a but week. Why, but why did it go up? Let's talk about that. Okay, so my South t- Korea? My t- yeah. So my take is, it, is the price went up because the, the Japanese government basically gave a blessing to the institutional investors, mm. says we support this. Now in Japan, culturally, that has a different meaning than in the U.S. That was like a blessing that says go forth and prosper. Yeah, right? it's not just, it's not illegal, it's, it's do like, it. It's almost like a, a blessing of, of please do this, the, yes. way, the way it was accepted by the market, Got which it. is very different culturally. That would not happen in the U.S. Got right? it. Because we, we always assume something's legal unless the government tells us it's not. Yeah. Right. So Begs so, for forgiveness. Right. So now that created a bit of a retail euphoria side effect in the U.S. and in Europe, where mm. retail investors started going to Coinbase and Abra and Kraken and all yeah. the other sites and droves. And basically started creating a, a, a feedback loop where there was this retail euphoria. It wasn't mm. institutional investors in the West. It was retail investors. There yes. are, there is no institution. When we say retail, just to be clear, I we mean consumers. consumers. We consumers. mean mom, dad, auntie, uncle, exactly. or large brother, traders, sister. Large yeah. individual traders, These are but individuals. not institutional. Not Goldman, not, not Morgan. Goldman. Right. Individuals drove. There is no, by and large, no institutional money in the West in crypto. Now, that's an interesting, that's interesting comment. Because, Goldman is not buying $10 billion to put right, it on there. Because... My point is, when they start, oh boy, look out. Now, so, so what does that mean for the price? Well, if there's not a lot of sellers, that means the market is driven by the volume of people that are buying, mm. right? Because the number of sellers is relatively fixed, which is an interesting phenomenon. So, so now, when the, when the craze died off... It'd be more like homes, because you're not selling your home, because you have to live in it. Exactly, exactly. So when the volume uh, or the, the, the level of euphoria started to die off, the price came with it. Right. Right. So that's really all it was, in my opinion. It's just, it's not a very liquid market yet, even mm. though the market cap is crazy. Right. So, but now come back, come full circle to like what Abra is doing. Yeah. Abra is not using Bitcoin as huh. digital gold. Abra is using Bitcoin as programmable money. Right. We need the liquidity of the exchanges to make Abra work. Got so it. if we end up with millions of users, by definition, it's going to drive interest in the institutional investors. Right. So if we're successful, it becomes a circular discussion. All right. When we get back from this quick break, we're going to actually demo the product, Abra, on This Week in Startups. Go to abra.com, and you can go see it, and you can download it. Just do a search for Abra in your iTunes store or in the Play Store, correct? That's right. What do they call it? I call it Android Play? Or Google Play Store. Google Play. Yeah, Google Play Store. It's a terrible store. name. They've been trying. Google, go to Google I think Play. it's, this is the fourth... I mean, it's so dumb. They're the fourth so incarnation of... Oh, yeah, exactly. It's terrible. Like, yeah. every... They can never just say something is like the, they can't call it the App Store because it's technically not allowed. Right. But Google Play, really? That having been said, we get 4x the downloads on Android because of it's global. Yes, right. and yeah. the international market is it's where all Android right. is is what everybody wants, and that's on right. Android. Okay, right. when we get back on this week in startups. Ah, yes, Asana. I am so happy with Asana. I have Asana up and running in all my organizations, and. Everything is running so much more functionally. And me, as the CEO, as the leader, I finally know who's working on what and when everything is due and what's on the to-do list. And just project management is going so smoothly here. And I have so much going on. Launch Festival Sydney, our syndicate, the incubator. I have personal stuff going on. You know, I've got a home. i got the second home. i got a lot of stuff I've got to do. I'm using it for personal. I'm using it for professional and everything in between. And you need to know, as the leader of your company, who's doing what? You need to know when everybody's work is due, of course, where all the information is, and how to tackle all these routine tasks that come up over and over again. And that's where Asana comes in. It is the easiest way to manage your team's projects and tasks. It is the easiest way to do that. And teammates can see the plans, and they don't miss all these deadlines or milestones that you need to get done. What I love about it, too, is people will put stuff on my Asana board and say, Jason, you need to get this done. So I literally, as the boss, have the true bosses, DeMont running the syndicate and incubator, Jackie running the podcast, 
everybody is feeding me tasks to do, and I find I am getting more productive because of it. And teams can create repeatable processes for reoccurring work like bug reports, creative requests, so everybody knows how to get work done. And you can view work the way you like. This is a key feature. You can do a list view. You can do a calendar, a timeline, timeline, which I love the timeline for our events. But I like the task list, the list view for my personal tasks, right? Because timeline events have kind of a timeline. But all my to-do lists, I just want a list. And then some people love using that Kanban board, you know, where you have all the different boxes. So you can view your work how you want to. 30,000 companies with teams in 192 countries trust Asana. Let me tell you a couple of the great companies using it. Airbnb, Uber, Thumbtack, and Facebook. I'm an investor in two of those four companies. And you can also integrate with hundreds of apps like Google, Dropbox, and Slack. Obviously, they've got all those great integrations. So start using Asana today for free. And really, the free product is so robust. I can't believe they give away the free product with all these features. Asana.com slash twist. Asana.com slash twist. I need you to go to Asana.com slash twist. Do me a favor. Put in all your to-do list items and just try it out. Let me know what you think. Asana.com slash twist. A-S-A-N-A. Asana. A-S-A-N-A dot com slash twist. It's just a great product. I'm so enthusiastic about it. Um, I love getting my email updates. I love getting my phone notifications. I just love having the app. The desktop app is beautiful. In fact, I have it as my number one, well, my calendar and then my Asana board. Those are my, and my uh, superhuman, my three products that I have in my first three positions and my bookmark bar. And all day long, I just go through those three and just try to make my life a little more structured and just a little more effective. And I feel more in control with Asana. Go to asana.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Sorry, I'm th- so enthusiastic. I love this product. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest today, Bill Barheit. And he is Bill Barheit on uh, the Twitter, B-I-L-L-B-A-R-H-Y-D-T. What is that, Barheit? What is it's, that name? It's actually Dutch. Uh, it's my, fa- Dutch? my father was Dutch. The name was hacked. So, so there was. Well, you go these... through Ellis Island and you got. Your well, name no, he's, he's much older, like Henry Hudson days. Like oh, okay. when, when the Dutch settlers went up the Hudson. Wow. Yeah, so they go back hundreds of years. Uh, Holy cow. So there's a whole kind of Dutch contingency upstate yeah, yeah. New York. That's where he's from. Really? Now, my mother's side is all. Uh, Do you know Ellis where? I- Kingston, Albany, uh, Schenectady, Rochester, Schenectady. Schenectady. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Of yeah. Course. So, so my mother's side, all Sicilian, came in through Ellis Island. Oh, your mom's Sicilian. Yes, and she came so, into. Could Ellis you imagine Island. Sicilian and Dutch? My father was like a wow, like a union yeah, my, communist, and my mother was like a Nixon Republican. Right, and so the fact that I exist is a miracle. Also, the Dutch are a little understated, and, and the Sicilians, uh, uh, they're you, vibrant. You think? You they're think? enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're my, effervescent. Uh, my great grandparents were bakers in Little Italy, and they couldn't talk unless they, they their could, hands. If were there up. was something in their hands, they couldn't oh. talk. Oh, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, when we left our hero, he was about to show us the new app. Hey, show uh, us the new app here. We'll pull it sure up. Sure thing. And we'll sportscast it a bit. All right. Which means I, if you're here. listening, I'll tell you what's going on here. He's got his beautiful iPhone All 10, right. as most CEOs do. Exactly. I'm joking. Exactly. All right, here uh, we go. So you got 12, so, 12 so dimes this, in here. This, this is a very basic portfolio view mm-hmm. that allows me to hold, as I said, 20 cryptocurrencies Crazy. and 50 fiat currencies in a single portfolio. Nice. I can click on the wallet here in the upper right corner, that little wallet, and mm-hmm. I can add any of these currencies to the app with one click. So I'm going to add... Uh, Ooh, uh, that. Beautiful. So you yeah. could add... Uh, I'll add... St- I think I have fiat. Stratus, but... Um, what does the oh. word fiat mean? I don't even know what that means. So I know fiat, it means like the... It, 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 I don't know the history of the word, yeah. but it, re- it refers to normal government-issued currencies. Government-issued currencies. I have currency. no idea where the word came yeah. from. Uh, okay. It's an interesting etymology question that I have yeah. no idea what the answer is. So you just brought Strat. What is that? No, I actually added a wallet for oh. Stratus, which is one of these new cryptos. It's got, got some it. really interesting security features. That's one of the things I love about this approach we're taking. If you think about Bitcoin, right, its its governance is decentralized, which yeah. means it moves forward very slowly. I think that's a feature, not a bug. Some people right. think it's a bug. Yeah, it's like our government. Well, you Look, have we to put have, Trump in, and we and he hasn't broken it. The yet. checks and balances work yeah. exactly. I agree with that. So the check, but the checks and balances in Bitcoin as a technology are extreme because mm. that's never existed in tech before. Linus right. Torvalds was a benevolent dictator saying right. this is the way Linux works: get on or get off yeah. the bus. Bitcoin doesn't have that. The side effect of that is that the tech moves forward very slowly. Mm-hmm. But our take is the best way to deal with that is lots of competing technologies. Do you think Bitcoin will ultimately be the winner? Because I look at it and go, yeah, I almost every time the first cryptocurrency or the first technology product becomes 
like a lesson in how not to evolve. And so it would make sense to me that Bitcoin would go to zero at some point and there would be something better that everybody would move yeah. to. So I, my take on this may not be normal, but I think that there's going to be lots of cryptocurrencies that are used for different reasons. I agree with that. Okay, and I think Bitcoin will be one of them. I think it will be more of the digital gold Got that's it. programmable. And I think there will be currencies that survive more for P2P payments, but more for financial engineering. It's just mu much more flexible in terms of lower fees, faster, better. Well, and all that, like Ethereum yeah. or other ones are, yeah. Bitcoin, ca gold, or whatever, so, cash. And if that happens, why would anybody keep their money there? Wouldn't there be a slow, slow or maybe cataclysmic move to the better one? Well, I don't think that there'll ever be a, a, a cataclysmic, cataclysmic move. Like I said, I think that it's very hard to... Why not? Because it has a network effect now. It's the one because that has... Because everybody believes in everybody it, knows what it's it is. hard to crack it. It's, it's, it has proven completely secure. It's never been hacked. Exchanges have been hacked. Sure. But Bitcoin itself has never that been hacked. That is the one thing that is fascinating. Why hasn't anybody been able to figure out a way to hack Bitcoin? Or is it that we just don't know that they've hacked it? Well, I, I actually uh, sent somebody a text on this today that was asking me for a quote. I said, the, the phrase I use was, Bitcoin to me is the Sistine Chapel of electronic money, right? Perfect. It, it is the, combina the culmination of, of, of the integration of four technologies in a way nobody ever thought of. Cryptography. Sure. Peer-to-peer -peer networking in the sense of BitTorrent, yep. which is how the money moves because mm -hmm. there's no central trust party. Proof of work, which is how Bitcoin yep. gets created, and distributed ledger technology, which is basically how what they call the blockchain. The blockchain, which is this global checkbook that we all write to, and that everybody owns. That's and that, public, and exactly. that is not stored in one place; it's stored in all places. Now, the breakthrough of Bitcoin was was that this magical Satoshi figured out how to integrate all four of these things to create a system that it was 100% immutable and has mm. proven 100% immutable and is actually becoming more secure exponentially. Immutable meaning it meaning can't be can't, changed or you, broken. You can't go back to the entries in last week's, the checkbook from last week and, and change, change them. It. It's no. impossible. The, the, the amount of computing power that would require is more than all the computing power in the world at this point. Right. That is the fascinating innovation. So therefore, maybe it sticks around. Right. Or... But, now, see, I think it's going to be cataclysmic. We, this is where we differ. Okay. I think what's going to happen is something better is going to come out that has more utility to it, faster, better, and it, ha and it shares all that perfection. So it is the 32nd chapel, you know, sure. instead of the 16th, and it's got so many other features that people just slowly get disheartened with Bitcoin, and they're just like, you know what? I used to use Yahoo Mail, but Gmail is so much better. Right. And they and that's the end of it. Or I used to dial up on AOL, but now I've got Comcast. It's so much better. So there's something that is just tenfold better but, that we haven't seen yet. But my perspective, both I would say from an academic perspective as well as the CEO of Avery's, I don't really care. Hmm. Because if Well, you, yeah, for you, it in, doesn't in terms matter. Of I'm how, just talking about the intellectual discussion. Uh, right, but in terms of how our smart contracts work, we're already using both Bitcoin and Litecoin in right. our smart contracts. Now, why did we include Litecoin? Which most yeah, of why your, did you use Right, most of your viewers have probably never heard of Litecoin. I've heard so, of that. Didn't the, the founder... What I know Charles, about Litecoin he, is the founder sold every Litecoin he has. That's right, he did. Uh, in that, order, to me, sounds crazy. Well, uh, uh, there's... There's pros and cons to that, which we can get into. Okay, yeah. Now, Litecoin is effectively a fork of Bitcoin okay. that increased the block size and increased or decreased the amount of time between blocks. Got it. Okay? So that, and, and because it's not faster. as... Faster. Right, it's faster. But when we started testing this new service in December, Bitcoin mining fees, meaning the transaction fees... It went crazy. $50. So if you were converting $5 of Bitcoin to $5 of Ripple in the Abra app... That was costing me fifty dollars. That's not well, a very good business explain model. Explain to a layperson why the transaction cost of Bitcoin, which was everybody perceived to be Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, the core rationale was free transfer of money. Why did it go from free to fifty dollars? Well, people only perceived it as free because the mining fee was a penny or a fraction ah. of a penny five years ago. It was never free. Okay. The mining fee is not based upon how much money you're moving around. It's based upon the size and bytes of the transaction. And blocks actually have a fixed size. In, okay. in, in Bitcoin, they're a certain size. And in Litecoin, they're a certain size. Litecoin is, is a bit bigger. But that limits the amount of transactions you can hold. Mm -hmm. Now, the miners who are competing to get new Bitcoin determine which transactions they insert in the next block. There's a pool of transactions waiting in this peer-to-peer -peer network to get inserted. It's called a memory pool. And the miners decide, based upon the mining fee, who gets in. So the higher the fee you're willing to pay... The quicker it goes. The quicker it goes. So people escalated it. Exactly. So in December, during this euphoria, 
people wanted their, their transactions to get accepted quickly, so they were driving the mining fees up. Ah. So this was a disaster. What is a mining fee now? Is it's it come now, down to- I think, Abra paid 75 cents a transaction yesterday on Bitcoin ah. and something like five cents on Litecoin, which is why we now support Litecoin as well. Got it. Because even if both skyrocket again, the mining fee we'll be paying for our Litecoin smart contracts will be tiny. That's why we support both now. Uh, now, what do you need? H- how do you make money outside of just the fee between the two? Because you're not a miner. We don't. I mean, our business model right now is 100% foreign exchange. Got it. So we rely on the people moving either between phones or exchanging currencies on their own phone. Got it. But when your people are buying Bitcoin or buying Litecoin for cash... We make money on that because oh. that's an exchange of dollars for Bitcoin. Got it. And how, how, do you, how much money do you make? How much do you charge for that? It's about 100 basis points to 150, depending upon how liquid the currency is. 150 basis points means... One and a half percent. One and That'd a, be the high end. One and a half percent. Yeah. Uh, I got gotcha. you. So 100, yeah. Uh, yeah, 150 basis points. Got gotcha. you. So that puts you in competition with the coin bases of the yeah. world. Yeah. So if you use their wallet on their app yeah. to buy Bitcoin, you're paying around that. The same thing. Yeah. So to buy into Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, you just got to pay... 150 base points, one and a half percent. Now, their trading service uh, might charge like 10, like 0.1%, uh, right? But again, this is not for traders. This is for retail consumers. I was told that Coinbase, if there was a problem with Coinbase, that the entire crypto ecosystem would be left in ruin. Is that true? Well, that's nonsense. Is it correct? And I can explain why. Yeah. So, so why think, does that think about exist? it this way? You've heard that, right? Coinbase is not a traditional cryptocurrency com- company the way I would define it because ninety nine point nine percent of their transactions happen in an SQL database, not on the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. Because they're holding the keys, so it's a net settlement in their own internal system. A hundred percent of Abra's transactions happen on the blockchain. We are not a custodian of keys. That's why Abra is legal everywhere. Whereas gotcha. Coinbase has to have money transfer licensing and register with FinCEN and all this other stuff. Because when you buy Bitcoin on Coinbase... You're buying it through their exchange order book. And saving it and saving your keys to their servers and they're encrypting exactly. them. Exactly. And you're trusting them like a bank, but to for crypto. To be the custodian of your money. That's Correct. what the word custodian means. That's what means the word custodian means in, in, in cryptography terms. Yeah. It means who's managing the keys. And in this case, when you have Abra, you have your own wallet or Abra you have your creates own wallet. a wallet? It's what we call multi-signature, meaning one key is on the phone mm. and Abra has one key. So Abra has no access to your funds. If the government comes to me and says, I'm here to subpoena Jason's funds on yes. Abra, my response is, I don't have it. It's on his phone. It's on his phone. What happens if my phone gets stolen? So the first time you deposit money on the phone, a big pop-up message shows up on your screen and says, it's time to back up your wallet. Got it. You get a backup phrase, 12 words, you write it down, you put it in a safety deposit box, your money's backed up forever. Got it. So it's just like when the winter soldier, they wake him up and they just... That's read it. 12 words like Manchurian Candidate. Yeah, not Just, as dramatic. But, not as dramatic. But but Unless there the, was like a billion dollars in coins in there. Sure, sure. Uh, in which case you could afford cryo freeze and it would be yeah. just as dramatic. So have you released how many people uh, have wallets on We haven't, Abra? but it's in the hundreds of thousands now. Hundreds of thousands of people are using this. Wow. Yeah. So that means if they're each putting in hundreds of dollars, you would have nine figures going through the system already. Yeah. Not 10, but nine. We, we have more than that going through the system. More than nine. No, no, no. It's, it's in the nine figures for nine sure. Nine Not tens. Yeah, yeah. And Coinbase yeah. has, obviously. Oh, they're, they're way ahead. They're way ahead of, of everybody. But, but think about it this way, right? This is a, a retail FX app. Mm-hmm. So a dollar f- flowing through their system is worth significant, significantly less mm-hmm. to them than it is to us yeah. in terms of return on equity and those kind of metrics. Where do you see the crypto world going? Because we're sitting here in uh, April of 2018. Mm-hmm. You were so ahead of the curve when we met, and we were both talking about crypto, whatever, four years ago, five years ago, we were talking about it. Um, now we see the spike. We all knew that was ridiculous. It was mania. Now we see, you know, Bitcoin below 7,000, which means if you bought it at 100, you're feeling pretty great about yourself. But what happens from here? Because you have the ICOs being uh, investigated, and in some cases, action being taken against them by the SEC. You have major law firms having to flip and change their positions. You have this general feeling, hey, maybe there's something real here, but maybe there's a bunch of scamming going on and it's anonymous. It's murky right now. Hmm. What uh, happens next? So, ultimate, And I know it's hard to predict the future, but yeah, what happens well, next? Well, the reason that I'm in this space is ultimately to drive financial inclusion. I want a single 
application slash network that is usable by 7 billion people. Hmm. Like I said, I want one app that's used by rich bankers in New York and hmm. farmers in Indonesia. And they, one person can be investing in crypto currencies using our smart contracts, and the other can be investing in stocks using our smart contracts. Got it's, it. it's the same app. Or sending money back and forth. To me, that turns crypto into, into TCP IP for money. Right. Now, when you start up Netflix, you don't, your mother doesn't know when she's using Netflix that it's creating a TCP IP socket to no. Netflix, nor should she have to. No, she my knows she picked her account from the uh, which user. Yeah. Now, my user. prediction is people will be using crypto as TCP IP for money with apps like Abra and not even know they're using it. All right. So let's fast forward five, 10 years from now. We get to a billion people owning crypto. Let's pick a number, a billion, yep. which is a massive amount of critical mass. That would be almost half of the people who are online, in fact. It would be worth trillions in the aggregate at that point. It would yeah. have to be. The, the market cap. The market Because right cap. now we have, what, millions of people owning it? We're pr- probably in the tens, 30, 40 million people. Own some level Aggregate of market cap of probably 300, 300 to 400 billion. With that many people owning it. Mm-hmm. So you would be 100xing it, which means we'd be at then 30 trillion or something like something that. Something like that. If it played out. But that would now, also largely be driven by institutional money coming in, not by individual consumers. Because if you factor in developing markets, the size of you know the yeah, wallet people could, be, are could making, be $5. Yeah, they right. might be making $10 right. a day or something. But you still something. need massive liquidity to support this type of solution. What happens societally? Because I've always thought the most interesting thing, and the first article I wrote about Bitcoin was just, wow, this is the most dangerous internet project I've ever seen because it's untraceable, it's global. This could be government destabilizing because a lot of the power of a government is their uh, control of the currency, the fiat. And so what happens to the United States or to China or to South Korea if the renminbi or the yuan or the U.S. dollar becomes secondary to a cryptocurrency? Mm. Yeah, this what was, will happen to societies? I gave a TED Talk in 2011 on this very topic when Bitcoin was trading at about $4. I think it was 4 or $5. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and the, the, the theme of the talk was what happens if cryptocurrency becomes the de facto you know, world reserve currency. Yeah. It's literally that topic, like uh, and almost seven, eight years ago. You believe that it will? I believe that it could happen. It could happen. Right. now. Probable or possible? Uh, if you had to pick one word. It depends how far out we go. Let's say 10 years. No, no way. Now go out 30 years? Possible. Possible, but possible. not probable. We're still in the realm of possible. Yeah, we're still going out further. You How know. do you think? But I think, okay. I think in decades, right? Because remember, yeah. of course I, I was at Netscape to. in the mid-90s. That was 20 years ago. Ah. Look, how, look how far we've come. You were at Netscape? 20, I didn't know I that. Yeah, yeah. You were for Morgan Dreesen or you came in I, long I, after his I gone? was 26. I, I worked on, no, I was, I was around the time of the IPI. I Where was that, on, Columbus? or uh, uh, What was that? Was it in Ohio? or uh, Where was it at the time? What? Where was Net, where is, uh, Netscape here in Mountain View? I oh, here in Mountain View when yeah, they yeah, moved yeah. here, yeah. Yeah, so no, I what worked... What did you do there? I, I worked on a lot of dot-com deployments. I worked on X509 deployments for first certificate authorities when we created oh, SSL. Amazing. Yeah, so my background is crypto going back forever. Protocols, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... So, but but I tend to think in decades. Yeah. Right? I, and and I'm, I believe in financial inclusion over decades time frame, not, yeah. you know... Obviously, I want our investors to have a great return on, on, on the investment in, yeah. in single-digit years, but I think in the big picture in decades. No, I think in decades, too, with my startup investing. Yeah. I just think, eh, in 10 years, we'll see what happens. Exactly. But but this crypto model, I think, back to the original point from, from a few minutes ago, is is improves the checks and balances in, in the governmental systems we have today because it forces the governments to rethink the, the, the centralized control over banking, inflating ah. currencies to oblivion. Right, spending people money will have a like choice. drunken sailors. Yes, if yes. they keep printing money, if yes. they do what they did in the financial crisis 20 years from now, and they say, hey, we're going to bail out all these financial people, you might just have a bunch of consumers say, you know what, that I'm taking my money out of dollars, and Absolutely. I'm putting them in euros, Bitcoin, and whatever other crypto or yeah. fiat. People blindly accept central banks with unchecked, centralized, use, unusurped power yeah. without questioning it. Why? Yeah, no, it is crazy. Yeah. Well, it's because we assume that the government has our best interests at heart. That's nonsense. And it, <laughs> well. I mean, no, you're right. They do assume that. Yeah, but we that very assumption that. is nonsense. Not because they're evil, right. but because they don't often understand the long-term implications of the decisions they make. I question the ethics of passing on debt to my grandchildren, who I don't even sure. know. Sure. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the concept of Medicare and the concept of pensions, like we've had to rethink pensions. Yeah. 
just as a general concept, there, there are some businesses that literally have been crushed under the concept of a pension. Like journalists used to get pensions. The New York mm-hmm. Times, in fact, was one of the few places left. And all of that strikes and walkouts at the New York Times were people in the buyouts. All that stuff we've seen over the last 20 years was around the pension mm-hmm. issue because people live too long. Yeah. To get half your salary for the rest of your life, if, you, if it was 50 years ago and you were retiring at 65, it's like, yeah, you're going to get your half your salary sure. for five or 10 years. Sure. Not 30. But, but banking and, and money needs to be rethought yeah. from the ground up. People are going to live in 100 years to be 125. We need to rethink all of this. Uh, so, yeah. You know, insurance, so, investing, money movement, payments, it all needs to be rethought in my it's opinion. It's starting to happen now. It's actually now that you think about it, the fact that boomers, our parents, uh, are living so long, 80, 90, yeah. and they're active and they want to work in some cases, their, li- their retirements are taking, you know, whatever, they're playing out over decades instead right. of a, a decade. Right. That just changes the entire game. The number of... and. They're looking at it going, what are my grandchildren and great-grandchildren going to inherit yep. with these incredible debts that people have to pay? Absolutely. Um, there was this other concept that um, bad actors would be using crypto. Do you have evidence of that or ways in which people can protect against that? Because there is a, I guess, would you describe it as pseudo-anonymity, anonymity, or... How would you describe crypto today in terms of the anonymous nature of it? Yeah, so there are different cryptocurrencies that have varying degrees of anonymity and privacy features built in. Right. So like Zcash, its entire reason to exist was to create a completely anonymous version of Bitcoin. Right. This is the version of Bitcoin people use on the dark web to buy drugs? Um, probably not yet. It's not as liquid, but there are other oh. coins like I think Monero or others that are that are play, playing that role. That's what I heard, that the Monero and Zcash, the, yeah. the primary use case was buying drugs on the dark web. It's probably like Silk happening. Road I don't, I don't, Silk stuff. Road too. I don't Silk know which, two, whatever it is, the degree 10. to which it's happening, but yeah. I'm sure it's happening. Now, look, every tech can be used for good and bad. Yep. I mean, it's not, it's not a cop-out. It's the truth, right? Sure. Uh, and, and so I don't think crypto is any different in this regard. But I think that, by and large, most people are using it as an investment vehicle today, right? But it's different in that it's money. Like, to, the idea of being able to move money around the globe anonymously was very difficult. I mean, you have people who've been caught, like, taping bricks of money to their body and, sure. you know, swallowing diamonds and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Sure. This allows the fluidity that... I'm, I'm wondering what the unintended consequences are of this. Like, it, Well, you have to think about the liquidity of this, right? So, so it is very, very hard to sell large amounts of cryptocurrency mm. off the books. Try, it is. Try. It's, it's almost impossible. Yeah, there was a guy in... Uh, Vegas, who just got busted. I don't know if you read yeah, this one. I did, of course. He got he, licensed. He was an unlicensed money transmitter. He was literally, if I got the story correct, maybe you know the story better than me, but he was taking, like I guess poker people were buying Bitcoin from mm-hmm. him and he was taking 10%. Yeah, which makes him an unlicensed money transmitter. So, so again... That sounds it, serious. It, well, again... It, it sounds it, like a serious crime. It, 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 is he going to jail? <laughs> look, the law is the law. I don't yeah. think that uh, yeah. buying and selling Bitcoin should be money transmission, but the law exists. My opinion doesn't matter. It is yeah. the law. So if you don't want to go to jail, follow the law. Yeah. Right? So... Oh, you would actually go with the... Uh, if you if you had your druthers that people could just trade in and it wouldn't be money transfer. Of course. Yeah. Of course. It's, of course. It, what's the difference between crypto and baseball cards in that regard? You don't have to be a licensed money... Baseball cards are bearer instruments. So why don't you have to be a money transmitter to buy and sell baseball cards or stamps. I think they're a little bit harder to move. Of course they are. Yeah. But that's that's not what the law... The law doesn't differentiate between difficulty of movement. Well, it should. I mean, if we're going <laughs> to okay, get into it, this, because it, the fluidity uh, in which you trade okay. something, it's sort of like the gun debate. Again, like, you can go talk to your... There is a big your, difference between a 30-clip automatic rifle and a pistol. Sure, but unfortunately, yeah. a lot of laws don't differentiate between those either. So exactly. uh, maybe they should. But that's yeah. my point, is, is that we just... A lot of people that create laws in this space that have no idea yeah. what they're really doing. Governments don't understand this, do they? They do not. Okay, let's talk about they the regulatory not. framework of the United States. It's great having you on the program. I miss you, Bill. Um, because you're really good at explaining this, and you actually have a position that you're willing to take, which I tell you, God, it's, nobody's willing to take, actually give me their real opinion on this <laughs> issue in some cases. <laughs> the United States is buttoning things up. We have a very patriarchal kind of approach to people and in investing here. We have the accredited, non-accredited. We're pretty um, rigid in how we let people spend their money in this country with the exception of gambling when they go to Vegas and put it up. Uh, 
put it all on black or red, but always bet black is my advice. Um, then you have other countries. Zug, this region in Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah. Brock Pierce is in Puerto Rico making his own little uh, nation state or whatever. Enclave. What, what, yeah. Who knows yeah. what Brock yeah. is up to? Uh, and other countries, and a lot of the ICOs and everybody saying, hey, listen, just no U.S. people. Is the U.S. being too conservative, just conservative enough? Or are we going to have the table run on us by another country which embraces this technology freely, perhaps has more unintended consequences as people laundering money, terrorists shipping money, maybe people stealing money, maybe people losing money in investments, but they have more fluidity, therefore mm -hmm. they have more innovation. So this What's going to happen? Yeah, this is a really complex question unpack because it. there's a... Sp I'll unpack it for you the way I look at it. There's a spectrum in crypto land which to me points to... Are you managing your own stuff or is somebody managing your stuff for you? Okay. Right. So look at it like BitTorrent. It's mm. impossible to regulate BitTorrent out of existence. Right. It's physically impossible. Right. right? You can't put people in jail for using it. it, it and that but has you're happened. still not going to regulate it out of existence. Not out of existence, no. Right. Okay. So now if you're holding your own keys mm -hmm. in crypto land, right. there is it's impossible, in my opinion, to create regulation that would prevent you from doing that. At the end of the day, that's software. It's ones and zeros. That's yeah, all, you that's can drive it underground, but you're not going to stop it. You're not going to stop it. But again, you're not going to make software an, illegal. Right. You'd have to do it. In, it would be an enforcement effort as opposed to an actual ban. Right. So now on the other end is somebody's managing your keys, right, which is the Coinbase or a hosted wallet issue. Yeah. And, and you can basically make the case those are effectively crypto banks. Right. right? They have, in theory, some fiduciary responsibility to consumers yeah who don't necessarily understand all the, the implications of what they're signing over, yeah. and therefore many would believe that government should play a role yeah. in deciding. Right. Or they're opting in to be taken care of by exactly. a bigger entity and, and paying for that privilege. Right. Or you've now become an exchange or some kind of broker-dealer. Mm -hmm. And so generally in the U.S. and in Western Europe, my experience is that the existing laws are being applied more or less correctly in those circumstances. Got now, it. it took a while for regulators, to my earlier point, to yeah. understand the implications of crypto and how the existing regulation should be interpreted. Right. But I'm seeing more and more clarity in different pockets of this, the SEC, uh, the CFTC for Commodities and Futures Trading, FinCEN, which generally deals with money transmission, which is the Treasury's police department. They all have a different perspective on this, mm. right? But they're all coming down more or less in terms of understanding where existing rules apply without having to define new rules. Right, which is at least encouraging that there's a whole not a, a whole new set of rules. Now, now some of their memos are new, and but they're clarifying the existing rules by and large. Right, the SEC seems to have taken their time. They didn't send mixed signals exactly, but they have come out very clearly of late saying, "Hey, these ICOs are all secure." ICO is a different story. That's yeah. the issuance of securities. Right, I mean, that's, but then they also, you know. I mean, there was also an IRS issue with people were trading crypto like crazy not realizing that if they keep moving it, it's a taxable event. Sure. But again, the, the existing rules applied. I mean, if you basically yeah. got into other commodities trading to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars, made money and didn't report it on your taxes, you would make That thing. was, uh, to me, the most hilarious Reddit thread I've ever read. I didn't read. I stay off Reddit. So oh, my gotta, God. Was, I just, the only reason I read it was because people were sharing it, and they were right. like, literally, people were like, this makes no sense to me. I bought Bitcoin. I sold it, I made some money, but I moved it into Ethereum, and then I bought Litecoin, and I made money on Litecoin, and then I bought this, and I bought that. You're telling me every time I sold that, I have to pay taxes? I, It's still all in my wallet. Right. And it was like, yeah, there's securities, and you had a gain. <laughs> well, like, commodities, I would say. Commodities, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, or if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. yeah it doesn't Commodity matter, though. It's the same It's the same. Either difference. way, it's short-term capital gains so, versus long-term. It's so, like, what's wrong with this country? It's like, um... This is how it's always worked. Well, well it's a big problem because <laughs> the average person who's bought crypto probably has no idea what they originally paid for it anymore. And then you have to basically figure out a cost. You know, you have a cost, cost basis. basis and, and, and it's, it. it's a nightmare. So on Abra, for example, we're sending people a transaction history. But if you deposit Bitcoin into Abra, I don't know what you paid for it. Right. So I can tell you what you might have sold it for. Oh, right. Because that's Coinbase got asked to give every record right. of but, every transaction over a certain dollar Right. Amount. But giving those records to the IRS doesn't actually say what the tax bill should be. Because you right. didn't always buy. I've mined Bitcoin. So my cost basis is zero. 
Oh, but the government well, doesn't know that. Yeah, your basis is zero. For, for some that? of it, right? Yeah. But I'd have to be able to, I'd, I'd have to proactively tell that to the government. And I would also have to understand how to tell that to the government. Wow. So this, there's going to be millions of people. Uh, the government, the IRS is not equipped to deal with this. Not equipped. There's no way. There's no way. I mean, the same thing with the SEC. When you think about the sheer number of these ICOs that occurred, somebody said 2,000 was the yeah. number. If it was, in fact, 2,000, I mean, how many enforcement yeah. officials would it take to just even have a the, an understanding of 100 of them? The only thing they can realistically do is treat it like an income pyramid, meaning start at the very top. That's what they're doing. And work yeah. your way down because yeah. you got to go because there's just not enough people in the IRS. Yeah, you go after the mat off. Yeah. You know. and, and But again, it's not about it. It's not about just assuming everybody's committing tax fraud. No. I mean, you have to basically educate people. You can't yeah. just assume that people don't want to pay their taxes and are going to cheat. No. You do have to educate people yeah. to some degree to say, this is how it works. This is how you set a cost basis. This is mm -hmm. how it works vis-a-vis -vis traditional commodities. And, and they yeah. really haven't done a good job of doing that. You know what I love about these kind of discussions? It reminds me in a lot of ways of the self-driving car discussion in that it gives you a chance to look at the history of society and implementation of rules that we decided and say, was that a smart idea? So for example, we're looking at this going and you brought up baseball cards. Uh, a lot of people use things like buying art as a way to hide wealth and keep it outside of wealth tax, et cetera. Sure. They just buy a ton of art. They give it to their kids. As long as there's taxes, there'll be tax evasion schemes. Right. But even as a scheme, it's like, I think if you, if I had a bunch of baseball cards and they were sort of fluid and I, gifted them to my kid or, I mean, does anybody even know that I have these baseball sure. cards? I mean, in theory, and, gifting a Mickey Mantle card is a taxable event. Exactly. And so you have all of this, like, how do we even begin to, uh, like I said, to I, frame I, all of this, right? I throw up my hands to the government's challenge in dealing with this. How, do you think moving these companies offshore, and have you thought about that with Abra, of like, hey, maybe I should be a Zug company or Zug? That doesn't really Why change. Zug? Zug. 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 I think Zug. It's Zug. Have you been to Zug? I have, because I lived in Europe for many years, so I've been... But you, ha you haven't been there since they became crypto land. Um, no, but I was in Zurich last week meeting with people from there because they're all touting how it's like a, a great place for crypto companies to set up shop. Got it. Um, now, we are setting up a nonprofit for part of our business where mm. we're going to open source certain software. Huh. Um, it's complicated, but basically in the multi-signature model, you have what's called a smart contract contract oracle and that oracle is a third party that protects the consumer if abra goes away ideally uh, you want that company to be in a different jurisdiction so that you can't get in cahoots to get keys to collect keys and it. switzerland is a good place for that because it's a friendly government but it's also unlikely to just give up the keys yeah, uh, they've got a long history of being able to during times of turmoil Protect. Mean, protect assets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know all the details about what's happening with all the other companies, but Zurich or, or Switzerland in general could be one place where Abra might consider doing that. But we are going to create this nonprofit entity this summer. What do you think the impact is of developers embracing this? A lot of great developers I see are getting into working on the open source projects in which they own tokens. So it seems to me that if developers are a massive currency here in Silicon Valley, right? Mm. Getting developers to work on your project, each one's worth some amount of money. If you're a developer and you see some crypto project occurring and you get in at a penny, a uh, coin or whatever it is, you buy $10,000 worth and it's uh, going up 100% every three months or something, you'd be much better off working from home on an open source project to make it change the world or working on three of them that you have just massive holdings in the coins. I agree. Look, if you're if, if happen, you're working on something that can change the world, like Vitalik working on Ether, yeah, uh, then please do it. Yeah, the world needs you. Yeah, uh, and you deserve to to get the rewards of the benefits of of, of that. Uh, the the question, of course, becomes who's going to change the world and who's mm -hmm. going to end up basically having something that goes to zero. To your earlier point about certain cryptos going yeah. to zero, but that's the risk you take as an entrepreneur anyway, mm. right? So I just think that in that regard, the token econo economy is really interesting for things that do actually represent viable technology, not just yeah. you know some pump and dump or marketing scheme. You haven't done an ICO with Abra. No, I'm not interested. Not interested. Not interested in having a utility token for transactions in some way that wouldn't be there's interesting? There's no application of that technology that makes sense for Abra today. I'm mm. totally open to the idea. It's just technology from my perspective. If something presented itself that changed my mind, that would mm. be fine. But just in terms of doing an ICO for the sake of doing an ICO, I'm not interested. Well, I mean, if you said, hey, we're going to just have our own transaction uh, fees paid for with this Abra token that we did on the... Ethereum yeah. thing, and you were able to raise a hundred million dollars instead of diluting, and then everybody would get to 
participate in Abra because of that? No? No, it doesn't. I, I just, it doesn't excite me. See, that's refreshing because I, a lot of founders I look at, they're so off the mission of their company and their products have no traction that they become obsessed with the fundraising mechanism mm. of ICOs. Mm. This is the really Well, my perspective is the opposite. If there was something that I think moved the ball forward from a product perspective or a protocol perspective that would really help our users, then I would be excited. Sure. But I haven't seen anything like that as, for, as it relates to Abra. Now, I've, yeah. I've seen a lot of ideas from either people in our company, users, or whatever, but nothing that's gotten me excited. Yeah. So that's the thing. I, I get it pitched on a lot of these ICOs, and I'm like, well, what about equity in the original company? Yeah, what happens to that? Right. I, yeah, and I'm like, it's unclear. Well, it's unclear. And then I've had a bunch of companies. I've had like about four scenarios that I recently got interviewed by one of these coin sites on my position on it. I had one company that did an ICO after I invested in them. Mm -hmm. Tala, Rob May's company. He was on the podcast. He talked about it. And he just gave warrants to the investors to have the ability to buy shares or buy tokens rather over the next 10 years. I had another company. I won't mention the name I invested in. They're doing an ICO or they did an ICO. They wanted to convert our equity into tokens. And I was like, no, I don't want to buy tokens. No, I don't want to do a transaction. I just want to have equity. But right. what if the, I told the founder, I was like, what if the tokens appreciate in value and the equity doesn't? Mm -hmm. Or what if the equity, equity skyrockets, you go public and the tokens flatline? Either party is going to feel so disgruntled that they're likely going to sue you. Right. Because when people feel Disgruntled, that's what they do. It has nothing to do with logic or what documents they sign. Well, here's the interesting thing about this tech, right? It is totally possible, viable, and actually not that hard to do to create tokens that function exactly like startup economics, meaning lockups, dividends like traditional stocks, uh, and other aspects of traditional startup economics sure. that are actually programmable because these are smart contracts. It's you just put it literally in the token. In, in the physically blockchain. in the software. Yeah. Right? That is possible today, but nobody's doing it because mm -hmm. everybody wants the ability to have these things be instantly liquid for good or bad reasons, whatever. That's yeah. what they want. I'm going to make a big... I'm speaking at this uh, conference tomorrow in Almeida. And oh, the, the Block to the Future? Block to the Future. I'm, yeah. I'm giving the keynote. Oh, cool. And I'm going to announce JCoin. <laughs> it's going to be my late April 1st. Not, not JLo coin, but JCoin. Not JLo, JCoin. Okay. And JCoin is going to basically be the premise of JCoin. You tell me what you think of this. All right. You made a ton of money on crypto. Now, remember, it's April 6th, not April 1st. I know. So okay. I'm just going to put April... Tomorrow's April 7th? I think it's... Uh, tomorrow's the 6th, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm going to put a 6, and then I'm going to cross it out and put a 1 on it. All right, all right. I'm going, to date, I'm going to date my presentation as April 1st. All right. This is my JCoin idea. You've made a ton of money on crypto, mm -hmm. but you're pretty sure it's going to zero and it's not going to go back up. Sell it now, be an LP in my next fund, and we'll take your crypto winnings and appreciate them through startup investing. Did you just make up the last sentence? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's my basic concept of... I just look at this. I think for me, the big takeaway from all this, aside from... There's like, the first takeaway is, hey, this is amazing technology that could change the world. We all agree. Right. There was this other technology, this other layer when the ICOs happened and the runoff happened. I just thought, okay, people are greedy and want to gamble. So there, there was this like gambling aspect to it that mm. everybody wants to gamble because they're literally buying stuff based upon it going up or down in a chart. They don't know what it does. But then the third one, I, which I thought was actually kind of a silver lining in all this is there is a global market of people who are looking for alpha, I think they call it alpha, like, you know, growth, yeah. change. And they want to bet on entrepreneurs, unproven entrepreneurs, to do new ideas in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was very um, eye-opening, that on a global basis, Tezos, this one, that one, EOS, could raise hundreds of millions of dollars based on nothing but a white paper yeah. and a promise. Yeah, I mean, the the, the, the messaging app, right? Uh, it was a Telegram. Tel Telegram, 1.7 billion. This makes no sense to me. Yeah. This one, I mean, they literally could tomorrow decide, we're done, we're not going to do it. Thank you for the $1.7 billion. There's no ramify, there, there's no recourse for people who buy tokens. This is the thing they don't understand. When you buy equity in a company and you have preferred shares. We have preferred shares in Abra. If you were going to do something with the company, like, I don't know, yeah. issue another billion you, shares. You get your money first, right? Yeah, or sell it. We would, we'd have some protective yeah. provisions where you could say, hey, yeah. Bill, you know, we kind of signed this document. Right. 
But I also think that even if they did what was in the white paper, yeah. which you know, I'll give them credit, I've, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. That's going to cost them at most fifty to one hundred million dollars. In the do. case of the Telegram, yes, the case, right. They so, couldn't possibly spend more than right. hundred so, million. So, so my opinion is is that the only thing that they could possibly do with the rest of that money, besides nothing, okay. is to create a private equity fund. Right. That's the end game. Right. And so thank you for the one point seven billion dollars investors. We are now a hedge fund. Which which effectively <laughs> creates an ecosystem for their own crypto that they've created. And, that and is, then the question is, because they have no experience in private equity, what happens to those investments in five years? Right? When they all or do they just simply all get written to zero? Right. Yeah. yeah. Or if they get lucky and it goes to ten billion, we've got a whole new well, economic model. Good, I mean, at that point, <laughs> at that point, good for them. I yes. mean, but you know, I, I, I unfortunately would have to say, I'm as a somebody who's not a betting man, I, I would probably bet against that happening. Yeah. It, also, there is something that is like the big money problem, and you know this as a founder of a company, which is more money, more problems. You show up the day after you raise money. And you're like, okay, I just raised $10 million. And we're like, oh, yeah, what kind of chairs are we getting? And, oh, where's the offsite going to be this year? And, you know, can yeah. I get a raise? And nothing to do with the core product or the flywheel of the business you're building. It's just everything is a distraction. Yeah. Imagine you have a billion seven in the bank. It's never existed before for a, a company to have a billion seven with no product. This is my point. I mean, there's... Well, they have do, a product, Telegram, but yeah, it doesn't... Telegram sure. takes five people to manage. Sure, but do the math. I mean, there's really only limited things you can do with that money besides doing nothing with it. And that's why I keep coming back to private equity because, mm. you know. Oh, you know what I would do? I'd buy startups. They could well, go. That is private equity. I guess so. <laughs> but if they saying. bought it and it was then branded as a Telegram X, Telegram sure. Y, that could be an interesting approach. Could be. Or they could end up writing right. them all off to zero. <laughs> All right. Uh, we could talk all day. You all need to get Abra. Now, are, is Abra and Robinhood on a collision course? Is, uh, do I have two investments that are going to collide? Because you mentioned equities the other a yeah, moment ago. I think are you going to allow people to put equities in this too with the fiat? Probably, but not in the U.S. Because people uh, in the U.S. have a relatively easy time mm, finding ed- equities, right? But think about it. a global app where yeah. somebody in Ghana could invest in Apple. Not only that, they could put $5 in Apple, even though the stock trade's higher, because Amazing. the smart contract gives you fractional sure. ownership. Right. So, so oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, so I don't or really. Or just a Vanguard fund. You know, like just if they could put $5 into a sure. Vanguard like device. Exactly. So, so I don't see us competing in that kind of traditional US. To me, that's, uh, I mean, they're competing on user experience mm. with a phenomenal commodity product. That's just not our DNA. Yeah. You know, you want to build something. Yeah. You want it's to... financial inclusion play. Yeah. I like it. Hmm. It's going to work, isn't it? How many people you got over there? 50. 50. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you can hear uh, Bill Barheit uh, give the keynote at Launch Festival Sydney on June 19th and 20th. You, you <laughs> didn't know, but you're going to be the keynote. <laughs> right. I'm putting you on a plane. This was a great discussion. You're going to come to uh, Sydney with us. I need a crypto speaker. You want to do it? I'm happy to do it. All right. There we go. We locked him in. Have you, do you scuba dive? I have scuba dived, yeah. You want to dive I'm, the Great I'm, Barrier I'm Reef after? Let's do it. Because right. I, basically, I did this thing in Sydney. I, I told the people in Sydney, listen, I love Australia. But I really want to dive that Great Barrier Reef. All right. I've only got one other person who wants to dive with me, so you'll be the third. All right. I'm, I'm going to rent a private yacht. I'll, I'm I'll sorry. Try anything I'm going to rent a boat. All right. <laughs> it's going to be a yacht. <laughs> and then we're going to dive for two Back days. Back to that, what kind of chair should we get discussion yeah, again? Well, yeah, well, okay. but listen, I earned it. Okay. Listen, Fair I'm, enough. I'm not running hey, the company anymore. I'm not paying, so I'm the You're not paying. CEO. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Listen, thanks to our sponsors. Go ahead and download Abra. Do me a favor. Download Abra and start playing with it and understand and Educate yourself. And send me feedback. Bill Barhead, I answer all of it. Yeah. It's always going to be bill at abra.com. I guarantee you that's his email. First name at company oh, name. Oh, boy. <laughs> no, it's always that. <laughs> it is. First name at company name. Yeah. Jason it, at inside. Jason at launch.co is going to go to me. You can, you can be certain of that. You're hiring too, right? I'm forwarding all my email to you starting tomorrow. That's fine. Okay. Who are you hiring? What positions? What's uh, the, what's the Engineering. Position? People are interested in blockchain programming, uh, m- marketing, product marketing. Hmm. Um, we've just did a massive amount of hiring and support, so we're good there. Oh, but, right, but, yeah. but engineering in particular. Engineering. Yeah. You, remote okay or no? You want Generally people in the office? not. You want to have we, people we in the want, office We here. want people in Mountain View. But you'll import people. We, we have, and we do. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good one. If you Listen, if you graduated from school or you're working in Atlanta or yep. Hong Kong or yep. Dallas or some other place, you want to come here and be part of a future unicorn and get onto the... This is what people need to do. The crypto bandwagon. Well, not even the bandwagon. You got to get into a unicorn startup with a great leader mm-hmm. before it's a hundred people, yeah. before the rocket ship takes off. The rocket ship's still on the landing pad here, starting to take off, firing the, the engine. The best career move I ever made was going from Goldman to Netscape. 
Oh, yeah, you got some equity in there, didn't you? Ooh, yeah. yum, yum. Yep. And then AOL bought and with it. a huge salary cut. I mean, massive salary cut. Yeah, what, 80%? Mm, 50. 50. Yeah. 50, but then the equity you got, yum, yum, yeah, skis, because yeah, Netflix good. went public. But I'm not, I don't even public. care about the equity. It's what it did for the rest of my career. Yeah, that made you. In right? hindsight, I would have done it for free. Sure. Yeah. Because you were on a rocket ship. Yeah. You always have and, and I got an MBA in startup land. For sure. Yeah. Was Mark Andreessen still there or no? He never left. He never left. Yeah. He was there the whole time. Yeah, he, right. He got he made he went to AOL. AOL. What was he like back then? Uh, a lot more nutty. I think he's more of a steady as you go. He was super like, nut. Super smart, you know, reasonable. Uh, he would fly off the handle in those days. Yeah, yeah. Right? He was a like, little nutty. You know, I worked yeah. with Sean Parker for a while. He was kind of the same, right? Like, he's right. like a steady as you go kind of person now. Yeah. A totally different person 15 years ago. Well, yeah, when you're in your 20s. And they Absolutely. tell you you're a genius, and you're you know you're in, and you're on the cover, on the cover of Time, of Forbes, or Fortune. Or no, he was on the cover of Time with shoes yeah, yeah, off yeah, 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 and yeah. hair. Right, it was back and, and hair. It was right. that long ago. I remember the picture of him sitting in front of the PC. Yeah, yeah like it was yesterday. him like on a king's tra- yeah. chair with bare yeah. feet. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And they're like, Legs this kid folded. is worth a billion dollars or something. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, what a great episode! Great to have you back. You were on the program before, or no? No, not on this. This one. is the first time you've been on. Uh, it is. I got. Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, we need to take a we need to have an editorial meeting where we go through the portfolio and look at all these huge winners and figure out who we've not invited to be on the program. Bill, you did a great job today. You My do pleasure. yourself? Okay. Great job today, Bill. Thank uh, you. And pleasure to be here. Con- yeah, and congratulations. It's great to see it working out. Uh, RRE Ventures, they did the A, right? Yeah, Jim's on the board. Yeah. Oh, Jim's he, on the Jim's board. Jim's helped me start the company. He's a co founder. I didn't realize that. I yeah. love those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Robinson Jr. Uh, yeah. Not although, senior. Although they've both been amazing to me over the years. Coca-Cola, yeah. right? Yeah. 40 Bar- years he was on the board. Barbarians at the gate. That's it. Jim Robinson, senior. Yeah. yeah. Got to get him. He's got some good stories. Oh, he would be awesome. Can you imagine the stories he's got oh. from the 80s and 90s? That would be amazing. If he could get him to open up. I mean, you got to... I would have to get him on retirement. A, he's such a gentleman. I know. The stories. You know, oh. Exactly. Can you imagine what was going on yeah, in those boardrooms? Yeah, but he's such a gentleman. He's never going to tell you. So. Watch that, that... You ever watch that HBO series, uh, Barbarians at the Gate? Uh, the, the, the show. The, the, the show. Movie. The, the movie. movie. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah, a mini with, series. Uh, Fred Thompson played, played right. Jim Robinson. Yeah. Could you imagine that you could say that Jim Rob, that Fred Thompson played I got to watch that again. I haven't watched that yeah. in 15 years or something. Yeah. That was the that was like the original great miniseries yeah. that you know H, HBO started to like yeah. lock I in. I just started watching Billions. Have you seen Oh my god, it's incredible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be on Billions. I've been talking to the I've been <laughs> really? talking to yeah, I've been I've been talking Did to Did you hear the, that? Brian over there at Billions. Uh, he wants to be on Billions. Well, I've been talking to Brian over there at Billions, the guy yeah. who wrote it. Koppelman, I guess his mm-hmm. name is. We, we're, we're like social media buddies. Okay, okay. And so I slid into his DMs. I was like, oh, the show's great. Yeah. I was like, we need to have like a thing where I'm pitching acts, like okay. just like a side thing where yeah. I pitch acts on like my latest angel investment. Right. And, like, and then he turns me down or like buys the company out for money, steals the deal. You know, just like a small cameo. Right. But I don't want to do cool. Silicon Valley. I don't yeah, want to do Silicon Valley. That's expected. That's but yesterday. billions. Yeah. Be like, oh, hey, Calacanis, what's your next Uber? And I'd be like, hey, Abra. Mark Cuban was on this past uh, week. Thank okay. you. Uh, yes, he was. He did a good job, too. Uh, he, you know, he was going to be in it. Right, I'm on season one, episode two. So Are you really? Yeah, so uh, don't Yeah, well, yeah. If you get through the first episode, <laughs> is the pretty, first scene of the first like, episode is like, whoa. Exactly. You're I, like, I, what's I, going on here? Exactly <laughs> right. Ay, ay, ay. Exactly right. It's really like, I think this is what people are going for. First episode of Billions. First scene, first episode, shocking. First episode of Black Mirror. Is the pig episode? Mm-hmm. And you're watching Black Mirror. Yeah, it's just like so episode. shocking that like you you want to like take a shower after it. Okay, like I said, everybody go download Abra and uh, start playing with the cryptocurrencies and uh, be careful out there. Yep. But people should own a range of currencies, right? Like, why does everybody keep all their currency in their native currency? That doesn't make sense to me. Shouldn't you own a basket of currencies? Well, first of all, when it comes to crypto, don't put in money you can't afford to lose. Sure. Right? Keep, it under, keep it under 2 3% tops. Right. Um, diversify in crypto, but, un- but do your own homework. Yeah. Like, get passionate about the tech. Yeah. And let that drive some of it. But, you know, just buy a basket and leave it there. That's yeah. fine. But be ready to lose it as well. Yeah. You know? I'm just thinking about fiat currencies specifically, it, to me, it's strange that we, people in Europe, put their money in euros, people in China, you know, people in Korea, Well, whatever. it's accounting, right? You pay your taxes in dollars. You don't pay your taxes in euros, right? But wouldn't it make more sense to have a hedge and blend it across the five leading currencies, your cash holdings, 
in case one or hmm. two goes up and down. I guess we take it for granted since we're in the United States and we have the strongest currency of all. Sure, it worked out well for George Soros, right? I mean, that's oh, how yeah. he made his billions was, I think he was shorting the pound, wasn't he? Oh, that's in, right. In the, in the early 90s or something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.